Good morning, church. So last week I uh, challenged you to help out one of our missionaries in Malawi, Dave Toms, to purchase Bibles at six bucks a Bible. And last week with, uh, with your help, over $6,000 was raised and we sent it off to purchase thousands of Bibles for, uh, for these new believers in Africa. So thank you for responding. Uh, that's really what it's about, just responding to what God uh, gave us the opportunity to do, to spread his love, to share the gospel, and we jumped on it. So thank you, church. Uh, moments like that, very proud to be your pastor. A lot of other moments where I'm not, we're going to talk about those now. So <laughs> we are in Matthew chapter 23. We are continuing our Woe series, Jesus and his encounters with the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, known as not just Pharisees, but they were also the priests in the temple. They were supposed to be servants of the Lord, and Jesus had some words for them, and woe is a, is a term of judgment. Jesus pronouncing divine judgment on these supposed to be religious leaders, people who knew better, and he was talking to them about their behavior. Now, we know in Bible times they were often the priests, but 1 Peter 2.9 tells us you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, that today we're the priests, you and I. We are the ones who minister to the Lord every day with our lives, with our actions, not just for a couple hours on a Sunday. You and I are priests to God. That's what the New Testament tells us. So if Jesus had this rebuke for the priest of his day, certainly we can look at it, we can soak it in and see what, if any, or if all, applies to us, what we can learn from it, how we can be more like Jesus. Because the world needs to see him, church. The world desperately needs to see the Jesus that you serve. And they're going to see it, not in church. They're not coming to church. That's why they're the world. You come to church. They don't come to church. They look at you. They look at you. They watch how you live. They watch how you talk. They watch how you respond to adversity. Your friends are watching you. Your coworkers are watching you. Your children. The next generation of the faith, they're watching you. And how we live testifies of Jesus for all these people, for the next generation. There's some parents who are dragging their kids to church because the only Jesus they're going to see is here because they're not seeing it at home. That's not how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to represent him everywhere, all the time, no matter where we're at. A world that desperately needs Jesus is looking to you. We need to represent him well, amen? Even if it's hard, even if it's tough, even if we got to fix some stuff up, any believers out there not perfect? Anybody? Still got some work to do? Amen. Lord, help us. Help us so that we can represent you well in a world that desperately needs it. You know, the point that I, I've mentioned each week with these Pharisees, with these religious leaders, they started off well. I, I believe they started off with the right intentions. They set out at the beginning of their lives, the beginning of their calling, to serve God, to learn the word of God, to represent him. But somewhere between where they started and when Jesus gets on the scene, they have morphed into something that Jesus didn't even like. They started well, but they became something Jesus didn't even recognize. See, we can, we can start well. We can come to Christ with all the right intentions. And you can be serving God for, for a week or for 10 years or for 50 years, whoever you are. How you start is good, but how you finish is so much more important. The Pharisees were not finishing well. They drifted. They became something unrecognizable to God. Far, far from who they set out to be. And that's why Jesus called them out. And I believe today, Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, lovingly calling us out for how we live to make sure, to be certain that the world sees Jesus in you and me. So that's what this series has been all about. We're in Matthew chapter 23. 
We've been going through doing one or two or three of these woes every week. And today we got two of you, two of them for you. The first one's from Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 and 26. Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of extortion and rapacity, which means aggressive greed. You blind Pharisee. First, cleanse the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. So on the surface, this one's pretty easy. This one's pretty obvious here. We have Jesus comparing the Pharisees and the religious leaders to a bowl where the outside of the bowl is clean, and you probably have some cute flowery decorations around yours. Guys, you didn't pick them out. So... Could you imagine the outside being clean, but the inside filthy? And Jesus uses that analogy for them. Says on the outside, you look good, but on the inside, it's not great. What's happening on the inside doesn't measure up to what's on the outside. He begins by calling them hypocrites. We talked about that last week. And he calls them blind Pharisee. You blind Pharisee. The Pharisees' problem was spiritual pride and hypocrisy. And spiritual pride makes you blind. Spiritual pride hears a hard sermon and says, well, I hope someone got got that message. I hope my spouse was listening. The spiritually pride person says that's for someone else. And that's the problem. Spiritual pride causes blindness. See, this is the hard part. This is the hard part of growing as a Christian if you've developed some bad habits or you got some things going on. Spiritual pride sets in and you can't see what's wrong with you. Other people can see it. We know God sees it. But spiritual pride causes that self-blindness. You can't see what's wrong with you. You can't see where you're missing it. And sometimes we'll hear a sermon or a word, and in our pride, in that blindness, we just immediately assume it's for someone else when the Holy Spirit's trying to get a hold of us. If the Pharisees were ever going to hear what Jesus was saying, they had to move past this spiritual blindness they had to move past their pride. If you and I are going to be the sons and daughters of God that he has called us to be, we have to throw that pride out the window. We have to say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I'm a mess. There's a lot of areas that need improvement. Holy Spirit, speak to me, lead me, guide me. And he'll do that. But if we sit back, all smug, the outside looks good, The inside, eh. Jesus can't work in that. We need to surrender ourselves to him. This was the issue for the Pharisees. That pride kept them from what what Jesus wanted them to learn, wanted them to know. Christianity, where it's on the outside looks good, but on the inside, no good. The Pharisees were very concerned with outward appearances, If you think about the Ten Commandments, there were 613 they had to follow, but you think about the Ten Commandments, all the commandments that required, all the commandments that could be outwardly measured, they excelled in. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So they would be very careful to hide their sexual sin so no one can see it. Thou shalt not murder. Well, they would not kill anyone, but in their hearts... They would be angry, they would slander, they would be abusive. Jesus says, your heart betrays you. See, on the outside, they would do what was necessary to keep up an appearance, but for the commandments that required something on the inside, love the Lord with all your heart. How do you measure that? You can't, only God knows. So their heart just stayed hardened. Honor your father and mother. Ha. How do you measure honor? You can't, so they didn't. See, if it was a commandment that other people could see and call them on, they would do it well because they wanted to look good. But when it came to heart issues, 
their heart was really far from God. Now, as a kid who grew up in the church in the 80s, I can relate to this style. I can relate to this idea of just making sure everything looks good. Because for way too long, the church has been more concerned on what was going on on the outside than what was going on on the inside. And you've heard this too from those who are outside the faith talking about church being just a bunch of rules. Do you know why they say that? Because for years, that's all church was for people. It was rules. It was some moral code. And as long as they jumped through the hoops and did the right thing, God would be happy. But that's not what Jesus told us. So as an 80s kid, I had my rules. Good rules. They weren't bad rules. No swearing. Okay, it makes sense. No R-rated movies. PG was pretty good, I was told. That probably wasn't the best advice, but that's what I was told. No school dances, because the devil goes to dances. No alcohol, no smoking or drugs, no Dungeons and Dragons. If you grew up in church, you grew up with the list of rules. You grew up with your own list that was handed down to you from your parents, from the church, from somebody, your own list of thou shalt nots. And this idea formed in our brain that if we abided by the thou shalt nots, we'll, we'll be better Christians and we'll be closer with Jesus. And something amazing happened, 80s kids. We broke every one of the rules. All of them. Because we learn something. Rules don't change your heart. Jesus does. See, the outside, the rules, look good. Keep up the charade. Make sure the marriage looks good. Make sure the kids look good. Make sure everyone behaves at least for an hour and a half on Sunday. So the appearances can be solid and will follow all the rules that people could measure. But the inside could be really far from God. This is what Jesus called the Pharisees out on. They had their rules, lots of them. They made sure they looked like they kept up with the rules and people would be impressed. But Jesus looked past the outside. Jesus always looks past the outside. He looks at the heart. Jesus told them, you need to clean the inside first. You need to take care of the inside. Take care of the heart. Everything else will follow. You take care of the inside first by laying your life down, by surrendering to Jesus. That's how we clean the inside first. You do that by surrendering. Surrendering sounds like you're losing, doesn't it? Is there something in our, in our human flesh we don't like that idea of surrender? It sounds like you're quitting. It sounds like you're giving up or something. Surrender, I don't want to surrender. We want to win. Uh. If you don't surrender to Jesus, you'll never win at this thing called Christianity. The only way to win is to surrender, to lay your life before him. God is not a set of rules that if we follow, he'll be happy. And if we don't follow, he'll be sad. <laughs> that, that is not Christianity. Because see, those rules, the whole Old Testament is, is a, a witness of this, filled with rules, but it didn't change hearts. Jesus came not to give us more rules. And these rules are good. These are not bad rules. <laughs> Jesus came to change your heart, to change my heart. So a transformation happens in our life. Why? Because religion and rules can't save us, but Jesus can. Jesus wants us to be more than just moral. He wants us to be his. He wants us to be holy and completely his. We belong to him. We can never be good enough to earn heaven. You can't perform well enough to obtain eternal life. It starts on the inside. Jesus wants your heart. He wants your life. 
He wants your priorities and he wants your obedience. When you clean the inside first, the motivations change. See, there's two different schools of thought when it comes to being a Christian. The one school of thought is we wake up in the morning and say, well, what can I get away with today? God, how far can I push this envelope and not have you totally disgusted with me? And you look at your set of rules. Well, what rules am I following? But there's another approach. When Jesus has your heart, you wake up in the morning and say, God, how can I honor you today? God, how can I live for you? How can I represent you well for others? God, how can you use me today to further your kingdom and your purposes? And at the end of the day, most people, they may keep the same set of rules, but one is doing it because they're madly in love with Jesus and the other is just trying to avoid hell. Motivations. When Jesus is first, when we clean the inside, Jesus changes our motivations. Why do you do what you do? Why do you live the way that you do? Are you trying to just avoid hell? Is like, is that it? Is that the thing for you? I can't do that, go to hell. Are you trying to impress people? We're gonna see that a lot with these Pharisees. We're, we're trying to, to, to show off to someone that we're a better person, look at us. Or do we live the way we do because we belong to Jesus? And he gets all of us, every part, and we live for him. He is our motivation. He is the why behind the what. List of rules isn't going to change your life, but Jesus will if, if you surrender. And you know the sad reality? There are Christians today who have been following a set of rules for decades. And their relationship with Christ is stagnant at best, non-existent at worst. Because rules won't save you. Being good won't save you. Jesus will. Give your heart, your life, your priorities, your family, your everything. Give it to God. Make him first in your life. Clean the inside first. This was the critical flaw for the Pharisees. They were so hung up on that outward appearance. They were so hung up on things looking good, but on the inside, they weren't good at all. Jesus continues, verse 27. <coughs> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So let me give you a little, little background here so we can get the full, the full effect of what Jesus is telling them. In Numbers chapter 19, verse 16, one of the 613 commands they had to follow, it says, whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields or a dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean for seven days. So basically for the Jewish person to touch anything that was dead, human or animal, a bone, anything would make them unclean. Now what did unclean mean? Unclean meant they had to leave the assembly leave the congregation, leave their family, leave the, the city, they would have to go through a purification process and only after seven days would they present themselves to the priest and the priest would allow them to return back. So for seven days, separate from their family, for seven days, separate from the community, separate from the temple, they were outcast, they were unclean for seven days. Now, we go back to our, our text in Matthew here. Jesus is comparing them to tombs. Jesus is saying, you might think the outside is good, but you're not just touching dead bodies. You're full of it. You're full of dead bones. You're full of all manner 
of uncleanness. If you touched a grave in Jesus' day, you're outside the city for seven days. Jesus said, you did more than just touch it. It's all inside you. You are literally full of death and uncleanness. So Jesus' words were even more cutting in that day than than they would appear to us. And what's up with these whitewashed tombs? Well, given the fact that if you touched any of these tombs, you'd be unclean, they went to great lengths to make sure that people wouldn't accidentally touch a tomb. Now, it's easy today. We have cemeteries where they're fenced off and there's headstones. Very easy to recognize. You don't accidentally stumble into a, a cemetery. But back in Bible days, it was different. They would bury people many times in caves. And many times these caves would be along busy stretches of road where, where people would travel. This was especially true around the Jewish feasts. Passover, hundreds of thousands of Jews would come into Jerusalem for Passover. And next to some of these roads, there would be places where people buried their dead, where they buried their family members. So one of the, one of the positions in this day they were to go out and whitewash these tombs to make them really stand out so that nobody would accidentally brush against it or sit and lean up against it or anything like that. So this term whitewashed sepulchers or whitewashed tombs, it's literally what they would do so people would avoid contact with that which is dead. And Jesus' response to this is outwardly, They appear beautiful, but within they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. On the outside, it looked good. The outside was put together, but Jesus is not looking on the outside. We read in the book of Samuel where the prophet is anointing David as king, and David didn't look the part. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him. And the Holy Spirit said, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Means we can't fool him. God's not impressed by our charade, by our acting. God sees what's on the inside. God looks at our heart. There was a commercial uh, circulating uh, about a year ago or so. There's this middle-aged guy, and he looked like he was in pretty good shape, you know, a little salt and pepper in the hair. And he was shirtless, headed towards the pool. It was a cholesterol commercial. Do you remember it? And all these middle-aged women sitting in their lounge chairs were pulling down their sunglasses to check him out, and he's kind of strutting. And then he gets up to dive in, and he does like this ridiculously awkward flop into the pool, and the numbers come up on the screen, cholesterol 256 or whatever. Do you remember that commercial? They, they made the appearance of a guy who looked healthy and everything was set and it was all together, but his cholesterol was through the roof. The outside looked great, but the inside, it just didn't measure up. That's what Jesus was telling these people. There was a TV show. I don't know if it's still on or not. Hoarders. Anybody ever watch Hoarders? That's a nightmare right there, isn't it? Sometimes the outside of these houses, not always, but sometimes these are beautiful houses. To look at the outside of the house, you'd say to yourself, wow, that's a really nice place. And then you go inside and there's a person living there who can't throw anything out. And stuff is packed in boxes to the ceiling. And there's a little path carved through it to like the living room and the bedroom. And that's it. Hoarders. Hey, listen, public service announcement. Old people, if this is you, throw it out. Your kids don't want it. Please, for us, throw it out now. Thank you. Back to the text. So this idea where the outside of something could look really good, but the inside, just a mess, just terrible. Outwardly, verse 28, outwardly you appear righteous, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The outside looked good, but the inside was so far from where it needed to be. Jesus said the inside was full of hypocrisy 
and iniquity. Remember hypocrisy last week? The stage actor playing a part, pretending to be someone he's not to fool an audience, and then he would go home and be himself. But the hypocrite is different because the hypocrite is constantly trying to pretend he's someone else. And it's exhausting. It's a miserable way to live. And as I was looking at this this week, the, a question popped into my mind. A question that just, it, it made me wonder, for, for those who live one way and then privately are very different, for, for those who are hypocritical, who are you fooling? Like, honestly, for the hypocrite, who are you trying to fool? Are, are you trying to fool your spouse? She knows. Your spouse lives with you. They know everything about you. They know stuff you don't know that they know. They know. You're not fooling them. Are you trying to fool your children? Like trying to keep up a good appearance for the kids? They're smarter than we think. Six, seven, eight-year-olds wondering why dad acts so different at church than he does at home. You're not fooling them. Who, who are we trying to fool? Are we trying to fool God? Seriously, like that's the plan? Maybe God won't notice. Are we deceiving ourselves? Does a certain measure of religion make us feel like, oh, we're better people than we thought we were? Look at that. We went to church today. Hypocrite, stage actor, pretending to be something. Who are we pretending for? Because ultimately, we're only going to stand before one. And that one knows the inside and the outside. Nothing is hidden from him. Nothing is outside of his sight. Makes you wonder, why do we do it? Why are we hiding? Ultimately, people who are trying to fool God realize that's not going to work. Unfortunately, there's some, there's some terrible teaching out there today. There's some terrible teaching that says if you just do these good things, God will be happy and, you know, you'll be a better person and everything else. And church, that simply is not the gospel message. That is not the message of salvation. Somewhere along the line, church teaching, well, you got to go to church and, and then God will be happy. There's a lot of people in church God's unhappy with. Amen? Yeah, I don't like it, but it's true. Well, if you just give at church, then everything will be great. There's a lot of people who give to church God ain't happy with. There's a lot of measurable outside religious activities that we could participate in. But God ain't looking at the outside. He's looking at your heart. He's looking at my heart. And I don't know how you feel about that. I think it might go back and forth. Sometimes God knowing our heart's a really good thing. Other times... Really scary. See, if you belong to Jesus and you are doing your best to serve him and you go through some rough patches and you go through some hard times and you make some decisions that you regret, you can rest assured in knowing the king of all creation knows your heart. He knows what's really going on inside. He knows that we all struggle. When Jesus went to the cross thousands of years ago, he went for sins you haven't committed yet. Jesus knew we would struggle. But if our heart is right with him, his blood covers all of our sins. He knows our heart, that's good. But there's a flip side to that that might be pretty scary. He knows. He knows your heart. He knows what's pretend. He knows when we're just going through motions. He knows when our motivations are off. 
He knows when we're just going through the mechanics of what we were taught Christianity is and we're just walking through the steps and our heart has gone cold, our heart has gone dry. He knows your heart. Same sentence. God looks at the heart. That could either give you tremendous peace, thank you God for your grace, or it can give you tremendous heartburn and anxiety because he sees through all the charades and he knows what's really happening. God looks at the heart. The Pharisees look good to men, but God had another opinion. God had another opinion. Jesus is looking not on the outside, he's looking at our heart. Jeremiah 17, nine says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's the verse I like to quote when people are like, well, Jesus knows my heart. <laughs> he knows it's deceitful above everything and desperately wicked. Yes, yes, he does. He knows your heart. God's looking on the inside for how you and I are really living. What's really important to us. I feel sometimes that the whole modern church thing has just come so far from Jesus in your life. Number one, you're living for him. You belong to him. Everything else just gets in the way and gets confusing. We make salvation about steps and hoops and all these other things. Give your life to Jesus. Pick up your cross and follow him. Die to yourself daily. God wants your heart. Not your church attendance, not your money, not your service, not your good behavior, not your no swearing, no rated R movies, no dancing. Jesus wants your heart. All that other stuff, it's not bad, but it won't change you. It won't change me. It won't convert an 80s kid who followed most of the rules pretty good most of the time. It doesn't change your heart. Jesus changes your heart. We need to make sure that God is number one, not just the outside appearance, but the inside. Man, we can get hung up on those outward appearances sometimes. I want to share with you a little bit from uh, Matthew Henry's commentary. How many of you have ever stumbled across the name Matthew Henry? Bible commentary, show of hands. Come on, put them up, put them up. I want to see. Okay, more than first service, or they were asleep and didn't raise their hands. All right, if you Google a Bible passage, one of the first commentaries will that will pop up will be Matthew Henry's commentary. If you have any Bible software, you get that commentary for free. I don't know him. I picture some old guy with a long white beard, probably a pipe in a rocking chair, bifocals pushed down his nose, just spewing nuggets of wisdom <laughs> in old English. <laughs> I don't know. I, I've never seen the guy. I have no idea. But that's kind of the mentality I've always had when I would see Matthew Henry. I'm like, oh, here comes a commentary from 200 years ago from some old dry guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, let's see what he has to say. What I didn't know, Matthew Henry's a gangster. <laughs> He's savage. <laughs> could, I, could I read a little portion? I wasn't expecting this from old Matt. He must have put the pipe down for this, slapped his Bible. Could I read to you the passage? Matthew 23, verse 28. Note, it is possible for those that have their hearts full of sin to live their lives free from blame and to appear very good. But what will it avail us to have the good word of our fellow servants if our master doth not say, well done? When all other graves are opened, these whited sepulchers will be looked into and the dead men's bones and all the uncleanness shall be brought out and spread before all the host of heaven. For it is the day when God shall judge not the shows, but the secrets of men. But here we go. And it will then be small comfort 
to them who have their portion with hypocrites to remember how creditably and plausibly they went to hell, applauded by all their neighbors. Oh, wasn't me. I just read it. Oh! <laughs> applauded. He was such a good guy. What a nice family they were. They really seem to have it all together. Wow. What a great commentary on the last part of this passage. That we're so hungry for the approval of men. So hungry for the approval of people. That we forget the approval of the only one that matters that the substance of our Christianity has become trying to keep up appearances for people who might clap all the way to hell. Strong word. But who do we live for? The outward appearance or the inner? I know there's guys here who are hitting it hard at the gym. You want to look good. Ladies here doing the hair, the makeup, going through six outfits, asking your husband which one looks good. He says the first one, but you still show him five more. <laughs> I haven't figured that out yet, but that's cool. All right, whatever works. We care sometimes way too much about the external. We care sometimes way too much about what other people think, but what is really going on on the inside. I note this, this contrast in our character when we were studying John chapter 15 this last Wednesday night and all these people, all these people in the world that we try so hard to impress, in John 15, Jesus drops this on his disciples. Consider this directly contrasted with how the Pharisees lived. The Pharisees lived for the approval of others. Jesus said, John 15, and you'll be hated by everyone because of me. What a difference. I want everyone to love me. You'll be hated because of me. If you are a follower of Jesus today and you stand on the word of God and you hold opinions consistent with the word of God, it doesn't matter how well you did your hair or how much you bench press. The world is going to hate you. Because when you stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ, they hated him first. And if they hated him, he said, they're going to hate you. Why are we trying so hard to impress people who ultimately hate us? Why are we trying so hard for people who are going to clap our way into hell? Instead, we live for an audience of one. We belong to Jesus. We live for Jesus. And his opinion is the most important opinion and nothing else is even close. There's no competition. It's Jesus and everything else a distant second. His opinion the only one that matters. I'll ask the worship team to join me as we close. So what, what is the solution to this? What is the solution for you and I? How do we get the inside clean? Jesus gave us the answer to this. We make the inside clean when we repent. When we repent, we have to open our eyes. We can't be blind. We can't be proud. If we are, we're never gonna see our need. But when we repent, there, there's two sides to this action. Repentance is one, acknowledging our sin. God, we're a mess. Jesus, we need you to clean it up. But it's more than just the acknowledgement. Repentance is turning away. It's a changing of your mind and you are turning away from that sin and headed in a new direction. It's not enough just to say, oh, I'm a sinner, God have mercy on me, and say that every day about the same sin over and over. That's not repentance. You're saying, no, I'm a sinner, God, and he goes, I know, stop it. That's your divine word from God for today for some of you. Stop it. Acknowledge where you're at. 
and stop it. That's how we get our hearts right. That's how we make sure Jesus is number one. And whether you've been serving God for a week or for the last 50 years, we all still need to repent. We all still need to examine our hearts and we all still need to make sure that Jesus is still number one. That he's the motivation, that he's the why behind the what and the how. That we live the way we live, not because we've always done it that way, not because of some rules, not because church people are watching. We live the way we live because we love Jesus. Because he's at the center and everything we do, we do it for him. This is how we clean the inside first. When Jesus was comparing the Pharisees to tombs, the obvious implication there couldn't be missed. What was inside those tombs was dead. Friend, today, if our lives are full of hypocrisy and we're more concerned with the outside than the inside, in the same way, our inside is dead but I've got great news for you this morning. We serve a savior who brings things to life. We serve a God who walks into dead places and he walks out victoriously with new life. And the story of the gospel isn't a story of improvement. It's the story of the dead being brought back to new life. And those dead places in you and those dead places in me and that inner hypocrisy, those areas where over years and time and hardships, we've allowed ourselves to grow cold, those dead bones, God will raise back to life when we repent, when we put him first, when we make Jesus the Lord of our life. Put him first. That's the challenge for us, to put Jesus first in every part of our lives clean the inside first and the outside will be clean. Jesus, help us to work on the inside. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I'll ask our altar workers if they would join us down front here. You know, we serve a God who brings dead things to life. We serve a savior who speaks life into dead and dry places. And friend, if you're here today and that's what happened with your spiritual walk, it just became something dead and dry. And you thought, man, I'm following all the rules. What am I doing wrong? Jesus wants your heart. Jesus wants access to the throne of your heart to be your savior, to be your king. And again, whether you're a new believer or whether you've been walking with Jesus for years, in the same regard, sometimes we just need to repent and let Jesus heal what's dead and let him be first in our life. If that's you this morning, I wanna invite you to come to this altar and cry out and respond to God. And maybe you're here today and you have some needs going on and some things that you're working through. Find your way to this altar. There's people up here who wanna pray with you. But let's respond to God this morning. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to touch our lives and to speak to us as only God can do, as only God can do. Church, would you stand together with me this morning? Let's pray as we sing and close. And if that's you this morning, I challenge you, make your way down front, respond to him. God is knocking on the door of your heart. He wants in. He wants you. He wants all of you. Your best life, your best future awaits in the arms of a loving God. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And Holy Spirit, thank you that you challenge us and thank you that you work in us. Thank you, God, that you are not finished with us. Lord, no matter how many times we've come and gone through it, Lord, your arms are open wide. And thank you this morning that all across this church, you're calling sons and daughters to new life in you. You're calling us closer to you. You're bringing us to the throne, God, where you can take total control. Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit 
would do a work in the hearts of your church. Do a work in our hearts, God. Be glorified with all that we are in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's respond to him. Let's worship him today.